right, so good morning, good afternoon, everybody. We've got an audience coast to coast joining us today. My name is Jesse Hildebrand, and I am your virtual adventure guide here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know we've got some familiar faces in the crowd. Hey, Mr. Dunn's class, Muskoka Highlands, Ms. Melnick's crew, our YouTubers, let us know where you're joining from today. We'd love to hear where all our classrooms are joining from. Uh, if you are joining us for the first time today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Everything we do, you guys well know, goes to our YouTube channel so you can check out this program, over 2,500 others, and this entire epic series to come right there when we're done. Now today we begin something that's been very special to me. For the last couple of years, we've had the chance to join a little bit early in doing an epic Ocean Week Canada extravaganza. Ocean Week Canada is this agglomeration of all the best ocean nonprofits, government agencies, amazing organizations and individuals coast to coast to coast to share stories, events, and more. There are hundreds of events happening across the country starting June 2nd through 11th as part of Ocean Week Worldwide. And today we are kicking off with the amazing folks of the Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition who helped us organize this incredible series for the Early Career Ocean Professional uh, Extravaganza. We've got a program every single day this week, all at the same time, with amazing young people working to make a positive difference on planet Earth. Today, specifically, we are joined live by Amelia Nimmin. She is with the Hakai Institute, who works to understand and chart some of the amazing biodiversity one of the most unique places on this planet, the west coast of British Columbia, and the islands there, sort of right on our, our furthest western shores. If you've never seen Hakai, Hakai.org to learn more about them. We'll be featuring that a few times throughout the broadcast today. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Amelia, who's going to take us on a journey of ocean wonders. Those are plankton, the millions and billions and trillions of organisms that sort of encompass the oceans of the globe, and her work to study them in a bio blitz on Galliano Island. Amelia! Welcome to the broadcast. Thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> hey, Jesse. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here today. So welcome to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, everybody. Um, unfortunately, Alana was unable to attend today, but that's all right, because I get to be here and tell you guys all about plankton and the planktonic world that we see every day on the oceans of Canada. Um, so to start off, I'm just a summer student at Hakai, but I love it. It's probably the best job I ever could have asked for. And when I'm not at Hakai, I go to the University of British Columbia, and I'm currently studying environmental sciences and majoring a lot in climate change around climatology. And then I'm also doing a minor in biology, which is perfect for when I do all my work in the biodiversity lab. Um, a little bit more background about me. I did grow up on the west coast of Canada, right where our field station is, and I think that is the reason why I have developed such an encouraging and love for everything that I get to learn and see. Um, so starting off with what is Quadra and where our coastal observatory is. It is halfway up Vancouver Island, if you are familiar with the shape of it, if you were to just pick a spot in the middle and then go towards the um, channel, you would find Quadra Island. And there we have a bunch of labs. It's where our main offices are. And I would say the most science that you can imagine comes out of this really unique and small observatory. However, this weekend, I am actually on Galliano Island, which is quite more south towards the tip of Vancouver Island, just between Victoria and Vancouver. So this is a vastly biodiverse place because you have streams from the Fraser Valley River that are coming in. You also have a lot of plankton that perhaps could be moving up from Victoria that we've never studied before. And so being on Galliano has just given us a much more um, immerse and grand look at what we are studying on Quadra. Now for a bit of context as to what a BioBlitz is, um, it's when a bunch of teams or schools or groups, volunteers, they all come together and they do mad biology and exploring and taking data for one weekend or one week straight. So I was here to study plankton, as Jesse was saying. However, there was teams that were studying lichen from the University of Alberta. So all the cool green things that you see hanging off of trees, like old man's beard, if you're familiar with that. And there was another team that was looking for this extremely rare snake called the shark tail snake. And they're sometimes found on these southern Gulf Islands of Vancouver Island. 
but very rarely. So I'm excited to see if we found one. Um, another cool thing that we were doing is we had about three different organizations that were scuba diving. And let me tell you, if you are interested in marine biology, there's a really big chance that you might get the chance to scuba dive. And it might not seem exciting, but being underwater, a place where not many people have gotten to see and look at the things that you're studying under a microscope is extremely rewarding and probably one of my top favorite things about my job. So now moving on to the next slide, I'll go back to the Quadra Observatory that we have and you'll see in the middle, this is our genome um, lab. So if you wanna know a bit more about what we have on Quadra and at Hakai, um, the Genome Lab is a very good place to start because essentially everything has a genome barcode and every piece of DNA can be sequenced in this lab. So for example, a piece of your finger could be put under one of the machines in this lab and we can figure out who you are with your DNA. Um, the photo on the far left is the view from one of our labs. It's probably one of the best parts about having a remote um, observatory is we get to look at things like this every day. And if you were to look up in the right corner, this is the Scout and it's probably my favorite boat to drive. That one in the Explorer, the Explorer has two engines. So if you're all about speed, that might be your favorite boat. However, the Scout is a lot of fun because you can maneuver it. You can get really close to sea lines, for example, so that we can try and take photos of them to see their behaviors. Um, so that is a cool thing about having boats in these areas is you can even expand what you're studying even more. And if you're to look in the bottom right corner, you'll see a bucket of a sample I took on Quadra two weeks ago. And this is a sample from one of our um, sampling methods, which is called a light trap. And I will explain that further on. However, in this bucket, you see a lot of worms and we call those polychaetes. Polychaetes are extremely cool because they come in every single shape and form. They're underwater. They're also above in the terrestrial world. So I do think that even though they're worms, they're pretty cool to study. So now moving on, I'm going to come back to our Galliano BioBlitz. So these are some photos that were taken this weekend. We were here from Thursday to Monday, and we got over a thousand pieces of genome barcodes, which means we got over a thousand things that we're going to be able to sequence back on Quadra in that lab photo that I showed you. And we'll be able to tell exactly right down to the family phylum of what this is, which means if you were to take a piece of DNA from my skin, you would be able to say, I'm Amelia Nimmin and I come from my family. So it's the same thing with all these organisms that we were taking. In this lab, we are going to be able to find it right down to its exact family that it's from, which is really cool because we're one of the only places on the West Coast that can do this, and it'll be very helpful for the future. But coming back to this slide, if you were to look at the far left, you will see that there is a beautiful sunset and this is where we were camping while we were here. So if you like camping, you like being on the ocean and you love DNA, as you can love many things. Um, I would say this is definitely one of the best parts of it is camping. And then this up here is also everyone. We had a really nice dinner. That was nice while we were here. But this photo down in the middle at the bottom, this is our portable laboratory which means we took a bunch of equipment from Quadra, packed it up really nice and well, and we were able to transport it here, which we do quite often, which means that we can do exactly what we do on Quadra, but here on Galliano. So we can spread our knowledge because science is all about sharing and collaborating and something that I truly believe in and that I think Hakai does very, very well is we share our knowledge and we pass it around so that one day when more people have questions, they don't just have to come to me or my partners, they can come to everyone else that was at this BioBlitz or everyone that's going to read the papers from this BioBlitz. So the fact that we were able to come here is very, very cool. Here's another photo. This is, I was very excited that we were able to set up the lab on Thursday. And down here, you can see at the bottom right, there's a scuba tank. And this is 
another version of our portable um, laboratories. And this is, we were taking all the samples that they got while scuba diving and taking little pieces from them so that we could release them back into the ocean and they would still be alive. Because all you need is a micro, micro piece, like the size of a piece of lead from your school pencil. That's all you need to be able to put it into our genome sequencer and find out exactly what family this organism comes from. So this is why we decided to do it near the ocean because it's much nicer than having to unfortunately kill a few of the organisms. So that is another cool part about being portable. And now just a bit more of an explanation as to what I do personally. Um, I fall under the lab technician and field technician category. Personally, my favorite is probably field technician because we get to drive boats and scuba dive as you see in this center photo here. This is us diving at Retreat Cove. I personally am not diving in this photo, but two of my coworkers are and I was very envious and I think they had an amazing time. They found some really cool things for us to study back in our lab. And then this field or this my apologies, this photo on the right is us doing some more sampling. This one's kind of boring. You could do it at home, which you should if you want to, because it's very cool. But you just take some nets and you put them in the water and then you collect everything that happens to fall into that net. Um, and then everything that fell in that net, we take back to the lab on the far left and we look under our Zeiss microscopes, which I'm not sure if you know what a, mic, um, a nanometer is, but it's so tiny you can't even see it. So we can see stuff up to 500 and 1,000 nanometers on these microscopes. So you know when you're swimming, and let's talk about the ocean versus the lake. In the ocean, I'm assuming you're not accidentally swallowing too much water because it's pretty gross. <laughs> but if you're in a lake, you do sometimes accidentally swallow water, and you're actually swallowing plankton. Um, so you can't see it, but under these microscopes, we can see it. But don't worry, you're not doing anything bad. It's totally normal. Everyone does it. It's what the whales eat when they come up to the top of the water. Um, now for our next slide. This is probably my favorite slide. This is plankton. This is what we're looking at under those microscopes. So I think a few of these are pretty obvious, um, like this guy at the far bottom left corner is a starfish and the little red dots, I hope you can see them because it's very unique, but those are its eyes and that's how it sees to go up to the surface at night when it's light and to go back down when it's dark. So that is very cool that we were able to see that. The one right next to it on the bottom is a nudibranch, which is probably everybody's favorite plankton in the whole world. It's actually a sea slug. And this nudibranch is orange, but sometimes they're purple, sometimes they're pink. I've seen blue ones before. So I think nudibranchs make the rainbow of plankton worth studying. And then this guy next to the nudibranch is also a starfish, pretty easy to see. But for example, the guy in the top right corner, the green one, he's a decapod, which is a crustacean. So he's going to turn into a prawn or a crab, something that has a hard shell. But since he, no, does, <laughs> since he has yet to develop his shell, um, he is in plankton form and he has no way of swimming. He just flows back and forth. Whatever way the current moves is where this little green plankton goes. And the guy in the middle that looks like a fish, well, that's a fish. <laughs> and the guy under the um, polychaete that kind of looks like a marshmallow, maybe a bit like an alien, he's also a starfish in a larva form. So that's the first form that they start as, as plankton. And then they turn into the one that's in the bottom left corner. So you can see lots of different forms of plankton on this page, and I would love to answer some questions about them further on. So quickly, the reason we are studying these is because we want to be able to have a database, which means we want to be able to, in the future, look on all the research we have done and see what 
has changed over time? And how do the animals change over time? And how is climate change changing? And one of the ways that we track this is by finding all the forms of the life cycle. So at the top here is the zoea form, and that is the smallest form of a hermit crab. And I'm sure you're all familiar with hermit crabs. They're very cool in my opinion. And then from a zoea, it goes to a megalope, which is fun to say if you ask me. And megalopes are also a type of hermit crab, but they're more advanced than the zoea, but less advanced than the stage at the bottom that has its full shell. So we all know that after a megalope, we all know what a hermit crab looks like, very cool little guy. And then this hermit crab is going to lay eggs in the sand. And then these eggs will restart the cycle. So it might be something you're all familiar with. However, this is something I see every single day at work, which is so cool because it's amazing to see that things are changing in front of you and that when you find something in the ocean, it could be advancing or it could be staying the same. Sometimes you never know. By taking all these samples and studying it under a microscope, we're really starting to know what happens. So this is a project that I work on. It's called Sentinels of Change. And you might see here on in the top left corner, there's a light trap. And that's how we find all these crabs, because at night, the crabs are attracted to light and they go through the funnels and then they get stuck. But don't worry, we mostly put them back in the ocean so that they can create more babies and that there'll be thousands more crabs to come. But this is, if you were curious, one of the ways that we sample for the crabs. And over here, you will see everybody looking through the sample to see if we can find anything cool. Because when you find something cool and unique, you get to name it and it gets to go into the database as a new organism. And that's pretty cool to get to name something. I try not to name them after myself, if I'm being honest, but there might be one or two that are called Amelia, spelt in some variation. And now it's going to go back to Jesse, who's going to show you a video that my team put together last year that's very useful about plankton. Dive beneath the surface of the vast North Pacific Ocean. Shrink down and discover the wonderful lives of the tiny, the miniature, the micro world. Drifters swept along by the current. These are plankton, living epic lives just out of sight. They are some of the most bizarre and otherworldly plants and animals on Earth. Though many of these critters are too small to see with your own eyes, they're some of the most abundant life in the oceans. And without them, the world as we know it would cease to exist. Come with us to experience the ocean like you've never seen it before. In season one of Micro Worlds, Plankton. So um, that is it for my slides, but I, if you, Jesse would like to come back to me, I can explain a bit more about why I think if you guys have the chance, you should look up micro worlds on YouTube because there's five videos and they explain exactly what I talked about, but you get to see more organisms from the small, tiny, tiny little plankton stage to the way bigger stage. So this is one of my favorite resources to tell people about. And I think that in classrooms, especially, it's fun to watch during lunch, perhaps. That's usually what I tell people if they're like, what do we watch? Um, I like my, I like micro worlds. Yeah. But thank you. Amazing. Well, thank you, Amelia. I'll make sure all our classes get the micro worlds plankton playlist on YouTube. It's a really incredible resource for a lot of classes. And they're super short videos. They're even shorter than our short videos that we put out. I know. If you guys love the daily dives we've got going on, you'll certainly love those. Um, Amelia, if you want to come out of screen share, see us again, have a bit of a conversation, whatever you need to do to make that a little easier for yourself. Live classes, I'm coming to you all for questions. We've got our amazing groups today that I highlighted at the beginning of the broadcast. If you're on YouTube, let us know where you're joining from. We're going to have an extra special Q&A today. So let's dive in. Mr. Dunn's class joining us at Rainbow Schools. If you guys want to come on in to kick us off in summary, you're good to go. Hey. Okay, great presentation, Amelia. I don't know if that was your first, but it was great. 
Um, yeah. ne Nehemiah has a question he'd like to ask you. What inspired you to study environmental science? That's a very good question. Thank you. I truly think that the place that I grew up and the amount of changes that I saw just in my own backyard from the time I was a kid to now really inspired me to learn about the environment and how it changes. And I think in the future, especially, there's going to be so many opportunities for environmental scientists because of the way that climate change is happening and many other type of natural phenomenon. So that was my inspiration was mostly the future. <laughs> Amazing. It's so interesting that so many of our speakers, regardless of topic, start out by getting outdoors and just enjoying the neck of the woods near them. Uh, it's what we try and instill in Backyard Bio every single May. Uh, but honestly, when you're done this broadcast and you're done your day, go to a park, see what you can find. The wildlife that's near you is extraordinary in its own right, and it always leads to more interest in the other creatures that you can find around the globe. So thanks for that, man. Great question. Uh, Muskoka Highlands, we're going to come to you guys next. If you want to unmute your mic, I uh, would love to have you for a question. You guys are like the comfiest looking classroom of all time. I love this. Highlands Academy, hi. What's with all these like awesome masks? Awesome masks. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're good. Unmute. Yeah, you're good. Unmute. There we go. Sorry. Hi. <laughs> we're uh, located in Huntsville, and uh, actually, one of our students was just asking how many different types of plankton are there? Wow, so it's probably in the billions if you were to go ecologically and also look in the past and what's to come because it's always evolving. So there is no concrete number, but I would say there's just as many plankton as there might be stars. That's a big assumption, but we actually have no idea, which is why I love studying it. Which is the coolest thing about ocean research. Like every time we go out, we find new species of plankton. It's like going into a tropical rainforest. Every time we look, we find new insects, we find new invertebrates. When you get down to the world of the very small, there's so much to discover. And as many classes know at this point, like the oceans are way less explored than the moon. We, we have taken the, the smallest sample of ocean wildlife and we're starting to sort of use these new tools to discover ocean wildlife in entirely new ways, looking for just DNA, for instance. You can get a spoonful of water, a cupful of water, and assess it for environmental DNA and find out that there's tons of things that we've never seen. We don't know what they look like. We don't know anything. So it's really the number of creatures is in the trillions, if not more, and the number of species is we have no conception. So I, I love this question. Thanks, Muskoka Highlands. Um, Miss Melanie's class. Okay, we're gonna hope that the mic works. So unmute, come in, and we'll check together. Hey, five sixes. Okay, can you hear us? Yes. yes. Yay! Go ahead. Mom. <laughs> so um, every time you take a big gulp of lake water, how much organisms are you actually swallowing? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> that is awesome. Um, so let's use an example. Let's pretend it's like a handful every time you accidentally swallow some water. Yeah, like what Jesse's holding up. There could be anywhere from two plankton to over a million in that gulp of water. That is unfortunately the answer. <laughs> Well, but this is the thing though, and it's such a weird thought that we're consuming this many things. But if you really look at the natural world on a micro scale, life is everywhere. You have little mites that live in your eyelashes, all of you. Like every single one of you in this class today have little mites that live in your eyelashes. It sounds ridiculous. You look at it under a microscope, you'll find them there. We have worms that live on our skin. If you have a puddle outside, there's like a billion things that live in that puddle. For some of you, you might have had the chance to use a microscope in your life. For some of you, it might come in high school where you get that first chance. The first time you look at a drop of pond water in a microscope will change your life. Like there's like thousands of things in there that you never knew existed that are everywhere around this planet. Uh, and it's just mind blowing. So I'm so glad we got that question. YouTubers, don't be shy with your creeds. We're gonna do a couple more rounds. We've got lots of time as Amelia had like the quickest presentation ever and I love it. Uh, so Mr. Dunn, come on back in guys, hey. Ashley, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you stop your leaf shirt in the winter or does it continue all year? That's an amazing question. Um, you might or might not be familiar with the word time series, but a time series is 
something that happens throughout a long period of time and ours is five years and it doesn't stop until the five years is over for this project so snow rain wind we are doing some sort of sample and that's why the light traps with the big water jugs are so helpful because it means we don't have to take the boats out and put ourselves at risk for accidentally hurting ourselves or harming the animals so versions of our samples get done all year regardless but good question seriously good question you guys are killing it in the q a so far classes i have put the hakai institute not just the playlist for micro worlds um but like all their videos because they've got some amazing shorts and a really wide variety of topics so do check those out uh, when you're done as well Muskoka Highlands, Mr. Shorts class. By the way, it's so nice to be in Huntsville. It's one of the most beautiful places ever. And growing up as a kid in Toronto, like passing through Huntsville all the time, you guys are like the most beautiful neck of the woods ever. So Highlands Academy, come on back in. Hey. Okay, then no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we're just getting a question ready. Do all plant things grow into bigger things? Oh, that's an amazing question. Um, actually, they don't. There's a lot that stay in the zoea stage, which is the first planktonic stage, and they just they can't grow. Their evolution stops at the smallest stage. And same for megalope. Sometimes they go from one plankton stage to the next, and then it stops. So it really just depends on the evolution of said plankton. And a really good example of that is an amphipod. So if you you will see it in micro worlds, and there was a few on my slides, but amphipods are amphipods. They don't turn into anything. They stay poor little amphipods forever. That's just their life. <laughs> One of those creatures that's like on the base of like every food chain in the world. Like all the big mm -hmm. creatures are just sucking up tons of those all the time. By the way, I like the gender breakdown in Mr. Short's class where the girls are just mobbing the camera and the boys are like 50 feet back. That's like a very classic thing for us. So thank you, ladies. Um, Ms. Melnick's class, we're going to head to Nova Scotia. Come on in, unmute your mic. <laughs> hey, grade five, sixes. What's one of the rarest type of plants? Ooh, rarest. Amazing question. Um, so yesterday, actually, we found a very rare, rare type of crab that we had never seen before. And it's so rare, it doesn't even have a name. But the reason it was so cool was because it was half iridescent, but then half developed. And that seemed to be its um, final plankton stage. So it means half of it looked kind of clear and half of it was brown which is pretty weird to think about when you think of a crab. That is pretty weird. I like the fact that eventually, like if you continue this work, you will undoubtedly get to name lots of new species. And this is one of the big joys of ocean research. So this is something that you can do as scientists for our kids today. If you end up in this field like Amelia, you stick with biology, you get involved in this, you become a researcher in any fashion, you get to pick the names for new things that you find. So literally, no one names themselves an animal after themselves scientifically. That's like taboo. But you can like pick people you really like or topics you really like. Maybe you like basketball and you want to name something after the Toronto Raptors. You can do that with an animal, which is super cool. So just a thought for you out there as a neat joy of life as a scientist. Mr. Dunstaff, we're coming back to you guys. Come on back in. Hey. All right. Samir has a question yeah. here. Samir. Yeah. What are some things you found in the nets. Some things that oh. you found in the nets, because in the preamble there was, uh, there was uh, talk about drag nets for gathering some stuff. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, the nets are very cool. Um, I don't know, have you ever heard of a sea cucumber? They just look like a blob, that's it. <laughs> and um, they have no way of swimming. And one time, because our nets are at the surface, right? And we just pull them up. And one time we found one of those blobs in our net, which was very fascinating because we had no idea how it got in there. Um, so that was cool. Um, I would say the most things that we find are some version of starfish larva or um, developed stage because we have a lot of those on Quadra. Same with barnacles. Oh my goodness. I don't know if you know what a barnacle is, but it sits on a rock and it's stuck there. And you think, this hurts my feet. I can't get it off. But actually they start as plankton just floating in the water. And so in our nets, we happen to pick up I had so many last week, I couldn't even see the bottom of the bucket. It was just barnacles everywhere. <laughs> Whenever you go to coastline, so any of our, our friends that have been to the east coast of Canada, west coast of Canada, if you go to a shoreline, you will see innumerable barnacles. So many barnacles, you could never count them if you live to be a million. 
Um, and I'm so glad we got this. And the fact that you highlighted in that beautiful plankton slide that like the larval form of the species looks so differently. Jellyfish larva, barnacle larva, crab larva, like you never know some of these were the creatures that they end up being, which is super cool. And just because you mentioned sea cucumbers, they're one of the freakiest things in the ocean. We have tons of time in this broadcast. Sea cucumbers can regrow organs. So there's literally like specialized fish that will go inside sea cucumbers, eat their organs like weekly, and they'll just regrow the organ, which is freaky and very unhuman um, and just very, very cool. This is the joy of ocean research. Really. This has been a, such a fun program. Uh, we, just, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, on one of the dives this weekend, we found a sea cucumber that weighed eight pounds. It was like this big. They are uh, really a lot of um. I know where I am. I'm in Newfoundland. We have an aquarium near us where people can touch sea cucumbers. They get them locally from the bay and they leave them there for a bit. It's one of the freakiest kind of creatures that you can interact with or see. If you ever get a chance to see one live in a great accredited aquarium, um, they're a special creature. Uh, Muskoka Highlands, heading back to you guys. Unmute your mic and you're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Um what education did you have to take to become a marine biologist lab technician? Great question. Yeah, that's an amazing question. So the cool thing about me is I'm still in school. This is my summer job. Um so I'm just gaining experience right now, which is also a type of education, but I did high school um, and middle school, which I think most of you are in. And then from then on, I just went to university, but I took a year off. So I was in no rush and I worked some other jobs that I also loved. And then when I did decide to go to university, um, I thought, well, what's something that I know a bit about and that I might want to learn a lot more about? And for me, that was marine biology. So I've done three years of environmental science with a minor in biology and I have one more left and who knows where I'll be. I might do a master's after that. Just, yeah, something. Well, you'll have to come back for programs regardless because you're a fantastic science communicator. So thank you for all of this. This is marvelous. Um, we're going to take four more questions, folks. I'm going to go to Miss Melder's class in a minute. One more round with everyone. And I will note too, just because this is a theme that keeps coming up in a lot of our programs, whether it's space, oceans, what have you. If you are interested in these as topics, but you aren't necessarily a science-minded person. Maybe you don't want to be like Amelia or I with a science background or degree. That is totally fine. There are communications people. There are artists. There are boat drivers. There are cooks. There are people that help set up camps. I mean, and this is just a small smattering of all the amazing jobs that are available to you if you're interested in something like the ocean. So as we talk about early career ocean professionals, we happen to be featuring a lot of really cool scientists over the course of this week, but really there's a, a wide variety of ways that you can get involved in these really special places and work with some really cool people like Amelia. So just keep that in mind. Um, Miss Melnick's crew, I'm coming to you. And then our final round, we'll wrap up after that. I will say Amelia's pretty cool. So if you guys have additional questions after the fact, you can probably email them to me and we'll find some answers for you. Um, there's like Hakai and Amelia are like all in on this, which is awesome. Uh, Miss Melnick, come on back in. Unmute your mic. <laughs> How long have you been working for this company? Ooh, for Hakai, yeah. Yeah, I so I this is my second summer. So it's been about a year and a bit. And I'm hoping to be here for a while longer because that's the nice thing about science is it usually takes a long time to figure something out. <laughs> and so I, huh. I'm on my second year and it's hopefully two of a few at least. One thing that we get a lot of uh, in our programs is people asking, like, how long are you doing this research project? Or if you're working in a Mars rover, how long did that take? And it's always a little jarring when people say, like, a decade. Or, like, I've been doing this for 30 years. And it's like, that is one of the joys of science, though, is if you love a topic, if you are fascinated with plankton, you can very easily make a career out of that. Like, you do not need to be pushed to some other field. You can if you want to. It, science opens up a lot of doors for you to both work with a wide variety of people, work in an amazing variety of places, and really follow your passion on questions that are of interest to you, uh, which I think is one of the, the very coolest things. But if you'd like to stick with something, if you're like a stable person, you can do that in uh, <laughs> in the sciences. Mr. Dunn, back to you guys for a final round. Come on in, guys. Uh, we were just talking as, as a group kind of about some issues uh, that, that we thought about. Um, what are the biggest threats to the ocean ecosystem around the island? And the other thing we were gonna kind of wondering about is who pays for all the research? Yeah, two amazing questions. Um, I'll start with our 
kind of system that we have at Hakai and who pays for it. And it's actually owned by the Tula Foundation, which is um, owned by Eric and Christina, who are amazing. And they're just really putting in so much effort and work into making sure that these threats that we definitely have, such as climate change is our biggest one around here, our oceans are um, the levels of temperature in the ocean are rising significantly and we're able to see that. They're putting so much effort and resources essentially into studying this, which I think personally is very important. And I know a lot of other people are passionate about that as well. So we're very lucky. But, you know, climate change, we all know that's a threat. There's a few other funny ones that are very unique to Vancouver Island. Um, BC ferries, actually, quite a threat. <laughs> uh, they create really big wakes that are not good for our shorelines. And they're also not good for the marine mammals in the ocean, like the whales. And if we don't have a lot of whales, then we don't have our life cycle that's happening, which essentially could really influence the plankton in what I'm researching. Um, another threat that we have um, around here is just weather. Um, we've been having a lot of droughts and then really wet winters that we're not seeing. And when these weather type of phenomenons are happening, they're affecting our ocean significantly because of the runoff from the coastal mountains. If you're familiar with Vancouver Island or the coast kids, it's basically mountains, ocean. That's all it is. You got nothing else to worry about. But um, when the mountain, all the water comes down into the ocean from the mountains, it can cause some significant effects. And there's a lot of people at Hakai that are studying that as well. I'm really glad you mentioned a variety of threats. This is something that we hear with not just ocean conservation, but global conservation. There's a lot of challenges right now. The good news is that there's literally millions of people around the world that are working on this every single day, trying to find ways to mitigate those risks, bring back the wild and do a lot of good. And so if it, conservation can seem sort of a pessimistic field sometimes, and I really, as someone who gets the chance to work with so many conservationists around the globe, scientists working to study this, there's so much reason for optimism. It's a really exciting time to be in, in this field. Because we've really started to broadly recognize the impact that we're having and work to make positive and tangible solutions, which I think is really, really exciting. So, Mr. Dunsclass, thank you for that. Um, Muskoka Highlands coming to you, and then Ms. Melnick to wrap up. Mr. Short, hey. We have two questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, what it has been your most successful find, and how deep can plankton go? Wow. Honestly, I should have mentioned the how deep plankton goes in my slide. That's such a good question. And obviously, of course, what's the coolest thing we found? Because that's something I'm very passionate about. <laughs> um, but for how deep plankton goes, it's through most the ocean um, at all levels. So we do some of our sampling at 400 meters, which is very deep. We do some of our sampling at two meters, which is very shallow. And as we all know, the ocean is not explored, but I'm assuming if we were to go millions of um, meters down deep in those trenches, we would find some sort of life and it would most likely be in planktonic form. And then what's the coolest thing we have found? It was that nudibranch. I don't know if you remember, it had like the orange kind of, um, we call it um, silly, silly, uh, I forget the name, but the orange thing that is coming off of it, we were all jumping with joy when we found that because it is very pretty and mostly found in the tropics. So the fact that we were able to find it here, I think that made all the scientists that I work with quite happy. I'm so glad you mentioned this because pretty much universally when we have ocean people on, if they talk about the prettiest thing in the ocean, it's nudibranchs. So sea slugs, it's like a criminal libel of the name of what these creatures actually are, but they are the most stunning things on earth. Look up sea slugs. It's an easy way to find nudibranchs very readily online. It'll blow your mind when you're done the program. Uh, Miss Melnick's crew, we're going to wrap up with you guys. Classes, this is one of the best Q&As I've been in in a long time. You guys are so keen and so enthusiastic about this. So thank you all so much for all of this. Um, Noah Scotia, wrap it up with you. Hey. All right, we have two quick questions. Let's do it. How much organisms does a blue whale swallow every day? Ooh, and? And uh, how many see-through species are there? Ooh, how many see-through species and plankton are blue whale swallowing? <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I know this feels like I should um, really start studying blue whales because I think their connections with plankton are huge. Well, I know that. So it might be something I do in the future because it can change. But I actually don't know. 
I would say that there's got to be a really cool YouTube video on that. Like, I'm assuming a lot of people have asked that before. I, I just checked this. Just, it was like a Google thing. Was it such a niche question? Uh, 16 tons they can sell through a day, which is crazy. So, uh, again, the individual plankton that make that up, given how tiny they are, is in the many, many millions, if not billions. Um, but a very cool thought. And then see-through plankton or see-through creatures. Okay, I would say this is very cool. My last thought, and you'll find this interesting, all plankton can be see-through, and what makes them not see-through is what they eat. So you might have seen a green plankton and an orange plankton. That's because the one that's green ate something green. The one that's orange ate something orange. And so that's how they become colored. And then as they develop as well, but when they're in the plankton form, most of them are essentially see-through. Very, very cool. Unexpected. Thank you for that wrap up, Amelia. Um, is there any final message before we bring in all our classes to say a big thank you and farewell? From my end, I'll say check out archive.org, uh, oceanweekcanada.ca for all the events coming, including, of course, this series with the early career ocean professionals and the Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition. A big thanks to them for bringing this all together. But uh, Amelia, any last words before our classes pop in? Yeah, thank you so much for coming, everybody. I had a great time and I hope you learned something. And I definitely did too. All these blue whale questions are making me very curious. Blue whales are pretty awesome, I must say. Well, Amelia, it's your first broadcast with us. What we do to wrap up every program, I'm going to bring in Mr. Dunn's class, Mr. Short, Ms. Melda's class to join me in saying a big thank you and farewell. You are <laughs> all in the broadcast. Thanks for 